We're back. We're still looking at PACE 116 in physical science. Uh, physical science, the first six PACEs covered introduction to chemistry. Now we are in six PACEs that are an introduction to physics. And uh, a lot of students ask, what's the difference between physics and math? And really, physics and math kind of come together. And the reason we learn upper level math is in order to solve real life applications of science problems. And so there is a lot of math involved, although the math that we're gonna be doing is very, it's all pre-algebra type of things. Uh, if you've had at least algebra one, you should be successful. The formulas might be new, but once we realize what the values mean, what the quantities represent, we just have to find in the problem what information is given, figure out which formula to use, and then plug it in, use your calculator, solve it, and you'll have the answer. As I mentioned in a previous video, and this section is really important for me to remind you about this again, the paces, uh, the answer that's in bold in the score key is rounded off using the rules of uh, significant digits. Now we covered that way back at the beginning, pace 1109. You may have forgotten those rules. Um, I don't want you to feel frustrated and I don't want you to uh, feel like you don't know what you're doing because your answer is different than what the score key has. So be very careful when you compare your answer to the score key. Don't just look at the bold print answer. Look back a step and see if when they do the calculation, because they always show you how they solve the problem in the solution section, look at the answer before the bold answer and see if that's the answer that you got. If it is, don't, don't beat up on yourself, right? If your parents want you to, or if your supervisor wants you to go back and take care of the significant digits, then do that. Otherwise, be assured that you did the math correctly, you solved it correctly, and the reason your answer is slightly different is because you didn't apply the correct rule for significant digits. All right, that's all. Let's jump in. Uh, this next section, hopefully you did well in your uh, checkup back there on pages uh, G and H. And... Uh, the next section is about gravitation, and I think if you read through that, that should have made sense, and you should have successfully done up through page K, I trust. And uh, even L is a lot of just filling in the blank based on your reading up through page 21. <clears throat> in this section, there are several new formulas, but I want you to notice how every single one of these formulas can fit into the magic triangle, all right? Uh, force equals mass times acceleration due to gravity. Notice that that's the same as weight. Did you know that weight actually is a force? Think about it. If you are sitting on a chair, you are applying a force to that chair. If the chair was kind of broken or weak, then the force of your weight pushing down on the chair would break the chair. If you sat down on an egg, you would break the egg, right? That's because you are applying a force. So Weight is a force, and weight is the mass times the acceleration due to gravity, which you should have memorized, is 9.81 meters per second squared. Work, talks about in this section. Work is a force applied for a distance. We're going to use that one a lot in solving problems in this section. And let's just think through again where we plug these values into the magic triangle. Since work is force times distance, the two that are being multiplied together should go on the bottom of the magic triangle and the other quantity would go on the top. So if I'm solving for work, I'm going to take force and, and multiply times distance. If I want to find the distance, I'll take the work and divide by the force. Or to find the force, I'll cover that up and take the work and divide by the distance. All right, pretty cool. You can do the same thing a little bit later in this section when you solve for power. Power is work divided by time. So work would go in the top, time in the bottom, and divide and you would have the power. Let's take uh, one of the problems that I'm always having to sit down with students and uh, go through step by step, and that's problem 61, okay, on page M. So open your, uh, open your activity pack to page M, follow along with me, have your calculator ready, and uh, let's try to do some of these. I'm going to set them up, but I'm not going to solve the problem. I want you to finish them, but I want you to see where the information is coming from. 
For, for A, it says, how much does the backpack weigh? All right, so we're talking about weight. Weight is mass times acceleration due to gravity. So for A, we're going to take weight equals mass times acceleration due to gravity. And that marker is not working too great, so I'm going to grab this one. The acceleration due to gravity, that's pretty easy. That's the 9.81. And if you go back and look in the problem, it says that the backpack's mass was, do you see it there? A 610 Newton hiker carrying a, and it tells you the mass of the backpack. And that's what you're going to plug in for the mass. Multiply those two together, and you'll have the weight. All right? Let's talk about B. How much work is accomplished to carry the backpack that distance? So now let's find work, okay, force times distance. We can plug into this formula here, the magic triangle. We're solving for work, so it's force times distance. The force is this number right here that you just solved, all right? So you're going to take the answer from A. The distance is given there in problem 61. It says he's 150 meters higher. So the backpack has been carried 150 feet, or meters. So you're going to take the weight, okay, which is a force, remember? So you're going to take that weight, the force, times the 150, and you'll have the answer for B. Then it says how much total work was accomplished. Now for total work, that means we're going to take the backpack plus the hiker. So for C, we first need to find out what is the total force, okay? Total force equals the weight of the hiker plus the weight of the backpack, okay? I'm using force and weight interchangeably because weight is a force. So don't let that confuse you. It's the same thing. They're both measured in newtons. So the weight of the hiker is 610. The weight of the backpack was the answer that you got from A. So you'll add those two together. And then the last step is to multiply that times the 150, and that will be the total work accomplished, all right? Once you've done that and you have the answer to C, the last step is what is the hiker's power? Power is total work divided by time. Now the work is the answer to C, okay? So once you've taken these two, added them together, multiplied that times the 150. Now you have the total work. For D, you're going to take that answer and divide by the time, but you got to be careful. Read the, read the instructions. It says don't forget to convert 23 minutes to seconds. Now I'm going to do that right here just to show you how we set that up again. 23 minutes, and I just like to put that over a pedestal. So I remember that's on the top times, and I'm going to put 60 seconds and put one minute down here. That way the units of minutes cancel, and the answer is going to come out in seconds. I'm not going to do the math for you. You have a calculator. You can multiply that out. Hold on to that number. Take the total work. Divide by the total time in seconds, and you'll have the answer for power. All right? You should be able to go back and do problem 60 in a similar way. Now let's talk about on page N some of these problems. Again, I'm not going to give you the answer. Let's talk about what formula to use because sometimes students are confused by that. We first have to look at two new formulas, potential energy. When I think of potential energy, I always think about Wild E. Coyote and uh, um, the, yeah, the Roadrunner. Okay. Had a brain freeze there. So I always think about the poor roadrunner, you know, outrunning the wily coyote. But the wily coyote, picture him up there at the top of a cliff, and he has a huge boulder that he's getting ready to push off, and he's hoping to crush the poor roadrunner as he goes beep beep and comes rushing by him. 
So up there at the top, he has a huge boulder. Now the boulder's not moving, but it's got a lot of mass to it, and it's sitting at the top of a cliff. We could figure out how much potential energy it has if we knew the mass and we knew how high it was above the ground, okay? The mass times the acceleration due to gravity, which again, we just have that memorized, 9.81. So the mass in kilograms times 9.81 is the weight. So again, we don't really have two different formulas. We can just separate this out, okay? Ma weight is mass times gravity. So we could write this formula either way. Sometimes you'll see it, you know, depending on the problem, either way. That's potential energy. Now think about this, as that uh, boulder is at the top, it's all potential energy, it's not moving. It starts to move as it rolls down the cliff just before it reaches the ground. Now the height has become basically zero. So all of the potential energy has now been converted into kinetic energy, okay? Kinetic energy is energy of motion. And so the kinetic energy would be the mass of that boulder times its velocity squared, which makes it usually a very big number, and then we just have to multiply that times one half, all right? That formula will give you the kinetic energy. At any point along the way, if you took the potential energy based on the height at that point, added the kinetic energy to that at that point, the potential energy plus kinetic energy will always equal the total potential energy at the top and will equal the total kinetic energy at the bottom. And so it kind of changes. Some of the potential energy is being converted to kinetic at each point along the way until it reaches the very bottom. Let's look at question 74. What's the potential energy of a 62 kilogram shell shot from a cannon to a height of 410 meters. All right, notice it's asking for potential energy. Notice that it gives us the 62, that's the mass. It gives us the height, 410, and we know, gee, we have that memorized. We have everything we need to solve for 74, all right? 75, What's the kinetic energy of a 1,600 kilogram car moving at a speed of 9.7 meters per second? Remember, the speed of 9.7, speed, velocity, same idea, all right, same thing. So I can take that velocity, plug it in here, I have to square this first, okay? Square that, multiply it times, this, times the mass, times one half, we have the answer for 75. All right, 76. We know the total joules of work expended to throw a discus with a force of 67. How far? Ah, all right, let's come back over here. Work is force times distance. We're asked in this problem to solve for the distance, and it tells us the total amount of work, 2010, and we know the force being used to throw that discus is 67. So work divided by force. See, cover that up. We'll give you the distance. See, the magic triangle is amazing. Just take the formulas, plug it into the magic triangle. You don't have to think about it. Am I multiplying? Am I dividing? How do I do this? Plug it into the magic triangle and solve. 76. We just did 77. A person who weighs 620 newtons climbs six meters up a ladder, all right? So again, we're just using potential energy, easy. Let's think about 78 now. That's one where it says think, and you do have to think on this one a little bit. A piece of rock weighing 95 newtons drops 62 meters. What is the potential energy of the rock at the highest point, okay? So let's think about Wiley Coyote again. The mass is, well, it doesn't tell us the mass. It tells us the weight is 95 newtons. So that's the weight. It tells us that the height is 62 meters. And so the total potential energy here at the top is going to be the 95 times the 62. It's not moving, so all of the energy is potential energy. 
Now think about it, as it's falling, just before it hits the ground, when it reaches this point right here, the width of a slip of paper above the ground, it hasn't stopped moving. All of the potential energy has been converted into kinetic energy. Every single Newton has been converted to kinetic energy. Now it hasn't hit the ground. And we're not asked at this point to figure out what its velocity is. We could find that. All we're asked to find is what is the kinetic energy. Think about it. It's kind of a trick question, but I think we've given you enough hints that you should be able to do that. Let's look real quickly at page P. Here's the problems that you're going to solve in doing your checkup on page P. And I want to point out to you again, that you have all of these formulas listed here and feel free to use those, all right? As you're solving these problems, keep looking up and figuring out which formula am I gonna use. Write the formula in, look at the problem and see what information is given, okay? You will always use, you'll always have one thing you're solving for and have enough information to plug in for everything else. And then just set it up, show your work for every problem. And then when you go to score, if you got it wrong, you can look and compare your work to the solution manual and see what you did wrong, all right? Be careful to put units for all of your answers. If it's asking for weight, weight again is a type of force, so the answer will be in Newtons, okay? If it's asking for work, total work is always in Joules. We have to kind of memorize these. Maybe make a list uh, by looking back in your pace of Typical units being used for the quantities being measured. A lot of the problems on page P are very similar to ones that you solved in your work on um, leading up to page N. If you have any questions, check your, check your solution manual in the score key and try to make sure you understand what you're doing. Don't just get the answer and say you're done. I know that's a temptation just to say you're done so you can go outside and do something, but try to understand how the formula is being used how the magic triangle can help you solve it, plug it in, get the right units, and then I think you'll be ready to do your checkup on page O and P. Thankfully, moving on, the rest of the pace talks about simple machines. On, on page S, it shows a couple of types. The formulas in there, again, magic triangle will help you with all of them, and they're very simple formulas to use, and I think you will not uh, find that section to be difficult at all. I'm not gonna, at this point, make a video about that, but then I do notice that on the checkup, I mean on the self-test, uh, there's a lot of matching, okay? And I would suggest that before you do the self-test, you study page Z, all those formulas, and all the things being solved for, and then again, all those formulas are right there, and it'll be that same way on the PACE test. The formulas will be there for you to use to solve the problems. I trust this was helpful, and that you'll be successful as you finish PACE 1116. And then uh, we'll see you again when you get to your next pace. Bye-bye.